So one of the things that happens as, well, to me anyways, as I've gotten older is that I just cry more often. <laughs> so, Billy, thanks a lot for that rendition was amazing. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, and I just, I'm not going to do a long introduction and talk about my kids and my grandkids and all that stuff. Um, but I do want to say to Pastor Rustin, thank you so much. Uh, I told you. <laughs> so I'm older than you thought I was. Uh, your friendship has been amazing to me. Uh, I, I never anticipated uh, when we decided to quote unquote leave ministry and, and move to Northern California um, that I would have an opportunity to do this again. Um, I had a mentor friend down in, San, uh, in Southern California tell me, there are people in Northern California that need to hear your story. And I thought, yeah, that's cute, thanks. <laughs> but here we are. So, and Pastor Rustin has given me um, his time and the ability to just sit across the table from him and, or side by side in a vehicle as we didn't want the conversation to end, uh, just to to unpack all the stuff that's going on in my head. Um, and I, I will forever be grateful for that. Um, your friendship means the world to me and I appreciate it. Um, to all the people here on the front row that now there's room for Cadence to sit because I got up. Thank you for being here. It's gonna cost me a lot of money because I had to pay them to come and sit on the front row. All right. Um, so I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, most of my earliest memories revolve around being in church or sports in some capacity. So, uh, and being from Southern California and the Raiders were in Southern California uh, at some point, they've been multiple places, but um, that's where my love for uh, the Raiders came. I pass that on to Jason. My apologies to all of you and to Jason because the Raiders have pretty much stunk all of my life. So... Uh, <laughs> can't explain why I was a fan, but I was a fan, um, and so, and I still am, and, um, and I watched the game last night, and we stink again, okay. <laughs> my grandparents gave me my first Bible when I was 12. I, I probably had a children's Bible or something like that before then, but uh, I got the King James version of the Bible, which in, in our tradition, that was, that was a big deal, you know, and so I got the, the, a Bible from my grandparents. My grandpa was the kind of guy, and my grandmother, uh, was the kind of, uh, they were the kind of people that would uh, underline verses of scripture in their Bibles, right? And so I'm uh, pleased to have uh, one of my grandfather's Bibles that he has written in and put notes in the margins and all that kind of stuff. But in my Bible, he wrote a note in the back of the book, and, um, and it says Mike, and then he wrote a, a couple paragraphs, but the first thing that he wrote after Mike was, God is faithful, God is faithful. So I asked Billy to sing that song this morning, and, and he did, and it was beautiful. If, they, if y'all just play that at my funeral, that'd be great. That's my, <laughs> that wraps it up for me, because I just know that God's faithful. So everything I bring to you today is from that perspective, okay? From this perspective of the fact that in my life, God has been faithful and continues to be faithful. Pastor Rustin read uh, our passage this morning and in verses 22 and 23 it says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Uh, the King James Version uh, says that he who promised is faithful. So in the early years of my life and with the help of my family and the scriptures, I developed a, a philosophy and a belief about who God was and how he was going to work in my life. I, I had kind of figured it out. I'm the kind of person that enjoys having answers to questions. I don't enjoy having questions. And so if I can figure something out, my, my whole philosophy has been around the fact that 
um, if, if God is faithful, I can check that box and I can move on in my life and just go along with everything else knowing that God is faithful. And, and if, if there's anything that I need to worry about, it's, it's going to be covered by God because God is faithful. And I uh, pastor Russin's right. I did serve in ministry for and and was a pastor for many decades. It sounds really long when you say, I'm, "That's why I wasn't offended." It was just one of those things like, "Wow, I am old." That's that's kind of a challenge. But checking boxes, I, I I like the fact that I can have a process and I can I can investigate something and find an answer to that question and then move forward. And most of my life, that philosophy served me well. That belief system served me well. There's a scripture in Psalm chapter 34 and verse 19. It says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And that was my experience with God. Sure, I had problems. Some of you are surprised by the fact that pastors have problems sometimes. But yes, we, we sometimes do. But God was always faithful and always delivered me from those challenges. I've recently been learning about a theory in social psychology called cognitive dissonance. In his book, Where is God?, Dr. John Townsend says this, cognitive dissonance is when something we know or believe is met with new information or experiences that don't seem to fit. So when we're confronted with something that challenges our belief system. And remember, I have developed over many decades uh, a philosophy of who God is and what he does and how he's going to work in my life. And then when I'm confronted with new information, what do I do with that? Now I have more questions. And I don't, you know, I don't like questions. I, I should not have questions. I just need to find the answer to these things so I can move forward and do things in my life. And so the book talks about that when we, when we have these questions, we can avoid things like that remind us of the question, right? We don't want to deal with it, so, so we just avoid those things. We, we can delegitimize the, the, the problem, the question, right? Say, well, the, there's no credence to that. I, I don't need to put a lot of value in that. Or we just can, can say, well, it's, it's not really that important. It's not that big of a deal. We limit its impact that way. But I would say that there's a fourth option, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And it's that of embracing the angst or that, that dissonance, that uncomfortableness that we feel. Um, so you're familiar with Jason. He's my middle child. That probably explains a lot if you <laughs> figure that whole thing out. He has an older brother, Daniel. We call him DJ. And he has a younger sister, Jessica. Jessica is my baby girl. She's, she looks like her mom, and she's, she's just like me. And so as we have these, it's just, she's like the perfect little mix. And she's watching online today, or she's going to watch it later. But I think she's watching online today. Jess, I love you. I miss you. And you know I've talked to you about this already. In 2017, my daughter came out to us as gay. And in my philosophy, the, the cute little box that I had built about who God was and how he was going to move, not only for me, but for my family, that didn't fit. It wasn't part of the equation. And so as she sat in our den on the couch across from us and was telling us this, all my brain was doing was flipping through the file cabinet in my mind of where's the answer to this? What do I say in this regard? What, don't, don't say something stupid, Mike. Don't, you know, all these things that are going on in my head and I'm trying to figure it out. And I had question after question after question. Now let me be clear. We love our daughter, have loved her from before she was born. We love her today. We, Jess, you need to move to Concord. Your nieces and nephews need you. We need you in our lives. We want to do life with you. And we laugh, but that's the honest truth. But I would be lying to you if I said that we haven't had challenges in our relationship. How many know that relationships can be messy? Relationships can be messy, and sometimes 
things that are not even on your radar smack you right in the face and bring a question to you that you thought you had the answers to. I know how God's going to move in my life. I've got God all figured out. And so let's just, we'll stay here in San Diego, California. We'll move on. All of our kids will come to see us and they will call us blessed and they will do all these things. <laughs> and no, they all moved away from it. That might say something about my wife and I have no idea. But this is a lot of therapy that needs to happen. That's all I'm saying, you know. Sometimes relationships are messy. I had a new experience that did not fit the neat box that I had placed God into. And sometimes we just have to acknowledge to ourselves that things aren't going the way that we thought they were going to go. In Mark chapter 9 and verses 14 through 29, there's a story about a man who brought his son to Jesus to be healed. And as he came to Jesus, in verse 23, it says this, Jesus says to the man, anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I've always found this passage of scripture to be interesting. Here's a man who's conflicted with two beliefs. He's conflicted with faith, I believe it, and doubt. Help me overcome my unbelief. And the desperate father didn't have anywhere else to go. He was out of options. And he's standing in front of Jesus and he's face to face with him and he has more questions. And so when Jesus says anything's possible to those that believe, he wants to say, I checked that box a long time ago. I have all my questions answered. But he has to say, help me overcome my unbelief. If you read the rest of that story, you find out that Jesus healed his son. And what that shows me is that having questions about your faith doesn't disqualify you from receiving God's grace. And you may hear a bunch of things and I'm trying to be funny and different things, but if you can understand this today, that having questions about your faith doesn't disqualify you from receiving God's grace, that's the biggest takeaway from today's message. God is faithful and he loves you regardless of your questions. So what do we do? What do we do when we're faced with these contrasting beliefs, different information, con contradictory information? There's two things. Remember this, God is faithful and the second thing is to embrace the angst, embrace the questions. In 2019, my dad had some health challenges he was in and out of the hospital a few times. Um, he went through radiation treatment in April of, of 2020. We spoke to oncologists and cardiologists and other kind of ists, and those were some pretty lousy times. So there all, also was some pretty joyous times. Jason had met Mandy. We met Mandy the day after Christmas in 2019. We got to meet Katie Bug and Race and Izzy on Valentine's Day of 2020. And it was great. We were adding to our family. We loved them. It was amazing. My dad continued to have ups and downs over the next few months. And the day after Jason and Mandy got married, my dad called us. And we were still up here. And... He said, hey, son, I'm in, I'm in the hospital. They admitted me. And so we loaded everything up and we drove home. And for the next couple of months, he had some ups and some downs. And then it was December of that year. And the kids were down visiting. And we got to go Christmas light watching. There was a, uh, a little block or neighborhood in our town that had Christmas lights called uh, Starlight Circle. And if you can show that first picture that, that I have for you, this picture of, it was really dark that night. It was, it was the power went out. Y'all can hear me though? Good, we can go with it. So eventually the power will come back on and you'll see this lovely picture of Jason and Mandy, Cadence and Race and Izzy and Sharon and myself. And we're 
It's a cold night in Southern California. That means it's like 70. <laughs> and and uh, we're having a blast, having a great time. We got, do you remember, I don't know, you might remember, Katie, but we had uh, cotton candy. We got cotton candy for you guys, and they all had cotton candy, and, and Izzy and Race had this cotton candy. This microphone here, Mike. Okay, don't touch it. <laughs> um, and so they had it all over their face, and Izzy, as, Izzy was wired. <laughs> How old was Izzy? Three? I think he was three. And he was running around like, and talking super, super fast. And, you know, as new grandparents, we were like just trying to bring this and, and understand it all and, and understand him and all the things he was saying. But it was, it was an amazing day. It was an amazing night. We were enjoying ourselves. We were laughing hysterically at the kids and how great it was. And the joy was undeniable. And that day was December 14th of 2020. It's also the day that my dad had passed away that morning. And here I was as a man that's a new grandfather, supposed to have all the answers, and I'm trying to understand how in the world can somebody have joy and grief all in the very same instance? How, how does a person... How, how am I supposed to respond to that? How do, I, how do I move forward? Because this picture, again, did not fit what I, the philosophy that I had about God and how he was going to move in my life. God was a healer. God's a healer. How, how is my dad not healed? It didn't make sense to me. And I was just trying to wrestle with all of these questions, all of these things and thoughts that came to my mind. How does somebody carry joy and grief at the same time? I'll try to speed up, so you got to listen fast because I'm going to talk fast. All right. <laughs> the Western and Hebraic mindsets are completely different. Here in the West, we like answers. We enjoy having answers to our questions. We got it. We move on. The Hebraic mindset really is about asking good questions, just having questions. In an article that I read a couple weeks ago, it says this, um, it was written by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. He tells the story of when Isidor Rabi, was, who was the winner of Nobel Prize in Physics, was asked why he became a scientist. And he replied, my mother made me a scientist without ever knowing it. Every other child would come back from school and be asked, what did you learn today? But my mother used to ask me, Izzy, did you ask any good questions today? The Old Testament has 613 commandments, yet there is no Hebrew word that means to obey. Now, I'm, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but this is what my research tells me. Instead of a word meaning to obey, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, uses a verb, uh, lishmoa shema. I'm sure I butchered it, so. Which is untranslatable into English because it means five things. It means to listen, to hear, to understand, to internalize, and to respond. Written to the very structure of the Hebraic consciousness is the idea that our highest duty is to seek and understand the will of God, not just to obey what we think God's saying. I'm learning that it's important to have questions and to ask them. And sometimes... That is two different feelings or thoughts or philosophy, philosophies about the things of God. That's a good picture, right? <laughs> I love Race's face in this. He's like, I'm not really sure what to think about this. Can I have some cotton candy? <laughs> Hebrews 10, 23, in the New King James Bible, it says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. In 2013, Sharon and I took a cruise to Alaska to celebrate our anniversary. Um, we got to each pick an excursion one of the days. We were on a, a, a cruise, but we, you know, the budget was a budget, and so we said, you, you pick an excursion, I'll pick an excursion, and we'll do it. And so I picked an excursion that we went on a helicopter in Juneau, Alaska. We took a helicopter to a glacier and we got off and then we dog sledded for like an hour and a half. It was the, yes, it was the best. It was the, it was the best time. We had a great time. I wasn't sure how I'd do with helicopters, but I loved it because um, 
Well, I'll tell you this. So I don't like heights. I don't like, I don't like the feeling of I'm going to fall off into a <laughs> canyon, you know, or something. So, but being in a plane, being up high doesn't bother me, but it's the feeling of I, I, there's nothing around me. Right, so I'm going to fall off. So I, we went to the Grand Canyon. I didn't like that too much. I mean, I could see it from a distance, but pictures of the Grand Canyon are great. You know, just don't get me by the edge of the Grand Canyon. That'd be great. Well, my wife, knowing this, and she's such a loving and sweet, kind person, decided that we would go zip lining. <laughs> so, so we get to catch a can Alaska. Is, the power's on. Okay, so show the first picture. No, the first picture, the two kids. There's t- see these two kids? These are our guides. They're like 10. <laughs> so it's like cadence being a, a guide, you know. And so they're going to keep us alive, these two people here. So here's Sharon uh, zip lining down. And she's, this is the last little zip. I don't know what you call them. The last leg of the thing. We were two hours up in the tops of these trees, well, not the tops, but they're 200 feet tall. We're about 100 feet up in Ketchikan, Alaska. So the next picture, I just approve, I w- this is me, a very stylish baggy jeans on I had back then in the 2013, but I did it. I'm smiling. That smile's a lie. It's just a lie. I'm not really, I was only semi-happy because this was the last part, okay? <laughs> Scared to death. We would zip line from one tree to the next tree. And when you would get to that tree, I don't know if any of you have ever done zip lining before, but they have a platform. And the platforms that we were going to were just built ar- around a tree. And so you would hook into this line and then you would zip line to the platform. And it, the first guide had already been there, so they will help you unhook. And then they hook you to the tree. And, but the feeling for me was that I was standing on the platform and I was scared to death because I knew I was going to not be able to stand on the platform. I was going to fall off. Now, they hooked me twice. I had two hooks to the cables. And I was, this is the weirdest thing I know, but I was fine about, well, just being on the line. I was okay because I just, I had no choice but to trust the line and the hooks. But you get me on the platform, I was never more afraid in my life than standing on the platform of a tree about 100 feet up in the air, even though I was hooked to it. Because, and and I figured this out later as I got back to the boat, back to the ship, was that whenever I was on that platform, I felt like it was up to me to keep myself on the platform. But when I was zip lining, I was just trusting the line. I was just trusting the cable. I was trusting the hooks. But if I'm, on, if I'm doing it, if I'm, I don't trust, I've learned this about myself, I don't trust myself to keep me from falling. Spiritually, if you can get the analogy, the scariest place to be is trusting yourself to keep you somewhere that you think you need to be and not trusting in God to keep you attached to the platform or to the cable. Sometimes we just need to trust God. With this in mind, God is faithful. 2 Timothy chapter one, verses six through nine and then verse 12 says this, This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Timothy from prison. And he says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, This is Mike's paraphrase. Not according to your own ability to stand on the platform, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And then look at verse 12. It says this. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able 
to keep what I have committed to him until that day. You're gonna have challenges in your life. Some of you are my age or older and you know those challenges come. You don't have all the answers. But I want you to know two things. God is faithful. And keep asking questions because God's not afraid of your questions. Be curious. Understand what it is you need to know about God. But always hold on to the fact that God is able to keep what I've committed to him. God's able to do it. And I'm grateful for it today. God bless you.